So welcome everybody to my wonderful HOA presentation uh, about the amazing and exciting resale certificates, which are a very important document that is the health of the association and the finances. And there's a lot of good indications in there about, um, you know, what, what goes on in the HOA, what you can expect, and if there is any special assessments, um, rules and regulations, what kind of the history is of the uh, association. Um, so I guess I'll start by just doing like a rundown of what a resale certificate is. And um, if you haven't seen one before, I've got a couple examples of them, but Resale certificate in its entirety, it does have to include a number of things. So a resale certificate form, which I believe is 27, typically looks something like this, where it's a lot of kind of information, but it's usually boiled down to things like bylaws attached, rules and regulations attached. Uh, It'll say on this document what the assessments are, if there are special assessments, and if there's anything due, any delinquent things on the unit, and then anything in the entire association. And then if the association as a whole does owe anything, along with most of the applicable fees and fines associated, and then it will have some good highlights about like, if there's any uh, projects that are anticipated or in the works, what the current reserves are of the association and the budget. So it'll usually just say budget is attached. And then if there's any lawsuits, judgments, where the insurance is with non-conforming, that's, um, so there's a lot of information on these, uh, some of which is very important, some of which is not so important, but good information to have. Um, and a lot of the times in the supplemental documents, you will only get this page. And then you usually have to reach out to the uh, listing agent to get everything else because this is not a resale certificate. This is just the more or less cover page of the resale certificate. The entire resale certificate has all of the supplemental documents that it is referencing and referring to in here. So I think I will start by just, if you're looking at this, what are the major things that you should look out for? And Obviously the major ones are like what the dues are and if there's any special assessments. I found this one and I thought it was really good because it does have special assessments listed and it's, it'll usually say pretty clearly this special assessment amount. This is not, fortunately for one unit, it'll be broken out into uh, each unit depending on how many units there are in the association and uh, most of the time, it'll be uh, based on the percentage of interest, and that's something that will be in the declaration. So it's this number, um, and then each each unit owns a certain percentage of the HOA, and so they have that percentage of that number typically broken out into some incredibly lengthy period of time. Um, this is the number of, or this is the amount of just regular monthly assessments. Dues are what uh, usually people call them, but the technical term is assessment because this is how much they're assessed every month. Special assessment is special because they didn't plan for it. However, if it's a good association, they should be planning for these types of things and making sure they have reserves enough to pay for all these projects. But I'll go over that in a little bit. Um, 
Delinquent assessments receivable. This is definitely a good thing to look out for. Uh, six units totaling 29,000. I think this one had 180 units. So this is something that lenders will look at and they want to make sure that this number is very low. And you also want to make sure that it's very low as well too. Um, this is just how many units in the entire association owe um, usually delinquent dues. How that can affect you is lenders will not lend on things that have a really high uh, delinquency rate. That shows that the healthy association is not great. And then also, uh, I have seen a couple times when I was working at the management company where somebody was applying for a refinance and their unit didn't have a lot of delinquent assessments, but because it was, I think one or two other units were so high, their bank would not refinance their unit. And it was a really unfortunate situation because this person was like, I am really trying to refinance and they were trying to get you know lower rates, but they couldn't do anything about it because the underwriter was just like, no, these other numbers are too high. And they were like, can you reach out and try to get these other people to pay? And it's like, I mean, yeah, that's kind of our, our job and we already have been doing that, but there's kind of not much we can do about it. So um, like we can't short, of putting a lien on the unit, there's not much the management company or the HOA board can do. So, um, is that just lender specific? You think, Henry, or is there exact? Um, I mean, it's it gets even. It can be like underwriter specific. So, when I was doing questionnaires for lenders, there were some underwriters who were like very kind of loosey goosey and like you know, okay, this. I can see what's going on here. This is acceptable. And then there were ones that were like, these are the rules and we must follow them. And like, so yeah, it was, it, it wasn't case by case. It was case by case. It wasn't like any lender was a little bit more lenient. It was like, sometimes the underwriters are a little bit more understanding. And some are like, this is the line that we need that has been drawn and nothing can be over this. There are no exceptions whatsoever. So, um, Fine schedule, this is usually pretty basic, uh, late fees, unscheduled move. I haven't seen that before, um, but typically every association, I mean, it's the same as a, a regular movement out, out fee. Um, these are all pretty, uh, pretty normal, where like if a new owner comes in, they have to pay a new owner setup fee to the management company, and then also to the association, um i've seen a staging fee before some associations are really particular about move in move outs some are not but there usually is a move in move out fee it ranges from about 250 to like i've seen a thousand dollars before um and then they will also this this one i haven't seen before where it's on the weekend they charge more that is kind of weird but um there are the charge move in and move out. And so you have to kind of be careful of like move in, move out. Okay. So that's $350 total, or is that $350 each time somebody moves in? Um, again, that's usually something that the escrow company will figure out, but it's good to know. Um, lease administrative fee. Again, there's the HOA management companies can throw in all of these just weird miscellaneous fees, and a lot of them do. So uh, condo questionnaires and escrow demands, uh, I've seen those start at 150 and then go up to about $400, depending on what um, the time frame is. Resale certificate, I believe the state uh, regulates that it has to be at $275. Um, again, the company that I used to work for and other people I know charge more for doing these on a rush basis, uh, escrow demand, they will order these, uh, they should order them within like five days of the closing. Cause it'll give them a really accurate snapshot of what everything is owed on that unit itself so that they know what needs to be paid off. Condo questionnaire is what's ordered by the lenders. So they can get a good idea of if it's something they're wanting or able to lend on. And again, if the escrow lenders are on top of it, they will typically order these 
escrow will order, or will order it within like five to 10 days of closing, just so they have a good idea of everything. Sometimes escrow is behind. And so they will not remember this until a couple of days before. So one thing that I try to do is just be in contact with escrow and kind of not, you know, just make sure that these things are being ordered. The lenders are usually really good about it, where like as soon as the um, file is opened, they will get this ordered. Um, and then resale cer certificate, resale certificates, because they have financial uh, information that are period specific, typically expire in 45 days, uh, but you can get them updated at um, like a, a lowered amount. So. That is something to be aware of is that resale certificates, the there a lot of the information is only good for 45 days. There's periodical financials in here that are like this month and last month's uh, finances. And so that'll obviously change in 45 days because it, um, you know, time progresses. Uh, anticipated repairs and replacements. This is obviously good to know, uh, although it's not always indicative of everything because this is typically been approved by the board of directors. So this is something that's already been voted on and that they're in the process of like soliciting bids. That doesn't mean that there aren't projects that are coming up, which usually the, the listing agent should, agent should be pretty forthright about it. And if you contact the management company, they'll usually tell you but there could be a special or like some big project that they're talking about, but hasn't been voted on. And that's something that you'll have to go to the minutes to find out, which are also included in the resale package. Um, reserves, obviously very good to know. Um, definitely correlates to the last one. Uh, but like this is good information to know, but the budget and the reserve study will have a lot more in detail information about this and what this number, if this number is good or bad, like having a million is really good. However, if they know that there's a massive project coming up, you're like, okay, this million dollars is more than likely going to be depleted here in the next year. So it could look good, but it also could be going away very quickly. So um annual financial statements that's all the budget periodical that's the one i was talking about uh it's you know this month and last month typically budget all of these will usually be kind of in the same area judgments and suits this is also another good one to look out for um the lenders are very wary on lending on things that have judgments against them. And it's also like you shouldn't, the main ones that you'll see are uh, like with newer construction ones, warranty claims against the builders. Um, lenders aren't so concerned about that, but the big ones are like insurance companies. Like if there's been a big fire or something, their insurance goes up, that makes everything a little bit more complicated um insurance not much to know about that other than there's only a couple companies that will insure condos at this time in seattle hub is one of the main ones um partners group and then like a couple farmers and you'll start to see like the same companies come up over and over again because they have Insurance companies just don't want to touch condo units. Um, and then this is the insurance for the condo association as a whole. Homeowners also need to get their own homeowners insurance, which is called Walls In. The association's insurance covers everything outside of the unit. The homeowners insurance covers everything that's Walls In from the unit. So everything inside of the unit. It's kind of convoluted, but Typically, the most insurance companies will do the homeowner's insurance, just not all companies will do the associations as a whole. Uh, Non-conforming unit alterations. This is kind of just like most condo associations have uh, rules about what you can do to your units. 
most of the time you can do uh, kind of not whatever you want to the interior, but you have pretty free reign. A lot of the times they'll have flooring requirements. If it's a big building where there's people below you, they just want to make sure that there's uh, it doesn't carry noise. Um, but then a lot of them are pretty strict about things outside, like having AC units and what paint you paint your the exterior and what windows you do. So um, deck weren't owned units and control. This you'll only see if it's a new construction where the uh, it, it'll typically be the builder still owns some of the units. Typically, it doesn't carry on past like a year or two after it's been built. Leased property, typically you don't see that. It's usually fee simple. That just means the association owns the land. Sometimes you'll see leased property. Uh, We've seen it if it's by a railroad because the railroad companies typically own all the land around it. Uh, unit sales and occupancy. This is a really good one to know because a lot of lenders will, and I, I believe FHA and VA loans will not lend on things that have a uh, rental. If, if more than half of the units are rented out, I believe it's either 40% or 50%, but they want that number to be pretty low. So 146 out of 42, that would probably be okay. Um, although if your person is not doing FHA and they're looking to do investment purposes, you want a higher, what's called rental, uh, rental cap where associations will have a rental cap, which is the amount of units that can be rented out at one time. So. Um, and then they'll give you the management company. Again, there's, there's a lot of management companies out there, but there's kind of like four or five main ones that you'll run into over and over again. And they all do things mostly the same, but you'll start seeing the same people come up over and over again. So, um, and most of them are pretty good at, doing these research certificates digitally. Um, the one that I worked at, the owner created his own resale certificate that had all this information um, and then it was provided digitally. There is one company that is amazing that it refuses to digitize everything. So then you have to go to their office and pick up this gigantic stack of paper and you have to pay $275 in cash, no change, exact amount of money. And it is, they are um, real fun to deal with. So there's that. And then you have to scan that yourself as like the listing agent and put that up onto um, the MLS or, or provide it to other agents. So that's something to be aware of. But most of them have, you know, progressed into this century and provide them digitally. And you can also pay with a credit card over the internet too, with like just a regular um, invoice. CWD is one of the main ones. They're pretty good. This is another, this is what their resale certificates look like. This is a very clean one. So technically the resale certificate is form 27, but you can make one that you can basically make your own that has things that are a little bit clearer, which that was the company, the company that I did, I used to work with, made one that was a lot clearer. This is also a lot easier to read just because it's kind of broken apart into just more succinct, um, easier to read. Uh, and like, if you are a listing agent, this is good information because this is a lot of stuff you'll need to put into the um, MOS, like number of buildings, what type of building, how many stories there are. So I, I very much recommend if you're going to list something that you order a resale certificate before it gets listed. One of the main reasons is it has all of this information that needs to go into the MOS. It also you're more, more able to get a feel of what the association is doing and like how you can market it most effectively. And, you know, like if there's special assessments, like 
you should probably uh, disclose that. And um, yeah, like if there's a garage, utilities included. Uh, um, so yeah, this is just another kind of form over your format, over your sales certificate you can comment to. Let's go to, oops. so this is what uh, over your sales certificate, the supplemental documents will look like, supplemental documents and addenda. So again, it has all this information on the on the front. The information we just went through. And then get down to balance sheet. These are good things to look at. However, it's also you need. I mean, I. I will look at these, but I refer to the reserve study and the budget as a whole. Uh, and also you need to let your clients know that we are not CPAs, so we can't give expert opinions about these. We can only give our own, you know, professional opinions, but that's limited to just real estate stuff. Things you just kind of need to look out for operating funds. Uh, just want to make sure that they have enough money to operate and then replacement fund. That's typically like, their reserves. Um, that's not great. It's also not terrible either. This is a breakdown of like what everything the association pays for. And then also uh, what income it gets. Typically the, be the biggest uh, income they get is just from regular assessments. That's, and then they are required by their de uh, declaration to put away a certain amount of money every single year. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of go down these line items. Sometimes they'll break them down even further, like maintenance and repair. That's pretty broad. That can include a lot of different things. Uh, like maintenance could be just like fire, a fire alarm repair, um, just regular like landscaping type stuff, although that's broken down there. Um, and then repair, like if the garage door goes out. So there is the company that I work for did break that down even further. But if you want more information about that, you can typically get that from the management company. Um, utilities, again, this will typically be just a, like a number on this page, but sometimes they'll break it out. Okay, this is how much they paid in sewer. This is how much they paid in water. This is how much they paid for electric. Um, yes. And most associations will, will pay for water, sewer, and garbage. Electric is usually always on the homeowner and cable. But the association as a whole will typically have a phone line that they have to pay for that's like fire alarms. So there's a bunch of kind of weird utilities in there that it's not a huge thing to be looking out for. but. Just general information, it looks like. So this is, it looks like there's a special assessment at this one, and this would be a notice that they would send out to all of the homeowners. This is where I was talking about where each person, each unit owns a share of the association, and then their assessment is then 1.24% uh, of what are, whatever the special assessment total amount is. And then typically people will have to take out loans to pay for these. So this is kind of like what it would look like for if it's financed, this is the lump sum, and then this is the monthly. This is the ballot that they would have voted on. And then here's where you can kind of go back and take a look if they haven't actually voted on something, uh, but they might be talking about it. Like, cause they talk about, doing special assessments. They talk about projects for like years before they ever actually vote on something. So if you, if it's kind of at the age where you think something might need to be replaced, envelope, roof, 
and plumbing are typically the big things. And um, roof is, you know, every 20 years, like residential or, or so. Envelope is typically like 30 years. Um, you can take a look back here and see if they've even, even been talking about it. Uh, but a good way to kind of get a better idea about that is the reserve study, which I think is one of the most important things to look at because it will show you all of the major components of the association, how much it costs to repair it, what the life expectancy is of it, and when they can expect it to be replaced. But there's also a lot of documents in here. Not all of it is very relevant. So reserve study is a engineering company will come to the association and just take a look around and look at all of the various components. So it's engineering company comes out and it'll typically say the, the first one has to be done on site and then it's typically renewed every couple of years and uh, it'll be valid for a certain amount of time. And the first one has to be on site. This one is no site visit, so it's an updated one. So somebody will come on site and take a look. Uh, that's actually not the one. one. Thankfully, Jason's uh, condo down in Ballard had a really good one. And it, this one is really easy to read, um, read and has a really good breakdown where, so this is a really important page to look at. Um, starting reserve balance, that's typically what the balance is right now current fully funded reserve balance, that's what it should be. Percent funded is 46%. That's not bad as you can see on here, but it's also not great either. Typically you wanna see it in the like 70 to 100% funded. However, in my time, I've seen most of them are in this range over here. So it's kind of like, not a complete gamble, but you should know that the average is somewhere here in the medium. And I've seen a lot of associations down at the, the weak area. Um, this basically is like, so in order to make up that difference, each unit would have to be paying $6,820 more a year, more or less. And because I'm a nerd, I love this kind of breakdown where these are all of the different things in the association that will need replacing or that are just a part of the uh, general makeup. So it's things like repainting the stairwells, replacing the carpet, and it shows you how much the life of that would be, and then how much is remaining, and then how much the replacement cost would be. So as you can see, there's things that are a lot of money. Exterior siding, $1.5 million. And then there's things that are not a lot of money, like overhead door operator remotes or replacement. Um, so this is kind of good to look at. And this one I really liked because it's it does do a really good breakdown of like, okay, this thing is gonna come up soon because there's zero life left on the expectancy and it's pretty expensive. Um, again, elevators are a nightmare and they cost a lot of money. We had one association that they were just repairing their elevators and in the process of repairing it, they uncovered just problem after problem. And it was basically like every week, it was another $100,000 that was added to the bill because it was just another thing that had to be replaced. And it, 
it was terrible, but it was also kind of funny at a certain point because it was just like, this is as soon as you open up an elevator, just all of the things go wrong and everything is, is extremely expensive, especially now during COVID, all these are very specialized parts that need to be ordered from like New York or someplace across the country. So it's just a lot of money. Um, it just goes over how they do reserve study, how much you contribute. Um, and then it'll go through and it'll have pictures of all this. So this is basically like a uh, very in-depth uh, inspection for an association. That's why I like it. That's why I think it's really important. It does a really good job of pointing out things that highlights everything, but then it shows the things that will probably need to be replaced when they would need to be replaced and how much that will be. So if you're looking at this and you see that, like say, okay, this plumbing is probably gonna be need to be replaced and it's kind of a lot of money. And then there's these other projects like the carpets will probably need to be replaced, but they're not, it's not listed on the special assessment. You can go back to the minutes and be like, okay, so they're at least talking about replacing the carpet. So that's something you can anticipate to happen here in the next couple of years. Um, ooh. Then the rest, the rest of the supplemental documents are things like the declaration. Declarations are not, there are some good information in their budget. Um, again, I don't, I don't want to pretend like I'm a CPA. I did a little bit of this when I was there, but I mostly just look at the reserve study because I think that highlights everything in a more clear snapshot. Uh, uh, declarations, bylaws, and rules and regulations, definitely good to look at, but um, the main things that people will probably be concerned about is rentals and pets. Um, Rentals, they, a lot of associations have, you can't rent to anything that's on, or the terms of the lease can't be under 30 days. Most of them are six months to a year. And then they also have rules on top of that about you have to live in the association for a year or two in order to be that, in order to then rent it out. There's a rental cap where only four units out of the 18 can be rented at one time, usually a wait list after that. There are some exceptions where if the owner is occupying it but renting out a room, they can do that. Or if it's being rented to an immediate family member, sometimes they have in times of emergencies that you can rent it out because you're, you just need the, the money. Um, declarations are typically very similar, but a lot of them, but every single one is different. Same thing with uh, associations. There's a lot of things that are very much the same. However, the actual contents will vary just slightly. So they're really fun. That's why I like them. Um, declarations and amendments. Like declarations all are organized almost exactly the same. So as soon as you start getting used to it, you know where to look for certain things. Um, rental procedures, pets, insurance obligations, repair of damage. Good things to know, good things to make your client aware of. I would have them read at the very least the rules and regulations, the bylaws, and just take a look at some of the declaration sections. Because um, then it'll also, breakdowns of units, this is another good thing because it has, most of them should have floor plan, and fireplaces. This is from the uh, declarant or the builder. So you can get a good idea of like what all the units look like in the association. Um, cool. You enthralled? You bored yet? This was my life for three years. It was amazing. Um, so just overall things that you should definitely be aware of and you should research like i said delinquent things um 
because lending, sometimes a lender will not lend on it, especially FHA. They have pretty strict guidelines. Uh, anticipated repair, repairs or replacement costs, those are the only ones that are actually reported. There could be ones that you know are in the works that haven't been voted on. Judgments, pending suits, these are good things to reach out to the management company about. Uh, I've had a lot of managers who like I started asking about something and they just gave me a bunch of information about it. And then some were kind of just like, yeah, there, there might be something. So that just depends on the manager or the day. It's super fun. Uh, unit occupancy, again, you want something that's kind of lower, higher owner occupied. If thing has, if an association has more owners that occupy it, that means that there's more people in the association and it's typically indicative of a more active HOA board and association in general. People who live in a place are more likely to want to upkeep that place as somebody, as opposed to somebody who's just renting out the unit. They don't usually care. Um, I mean, rental people are a lot, are notorious for just not having the level of ownership as an owner makes sense. Uh, insurance companies have real big issues with uh, associations that have high rental capacity or occupancy. There was an association that I worked with where their rental uh, occupancy was very high and they had a high uh, occurrence of theft and break-ins and a lot of uh, real not fun issues to deal with. Um, although I do think that if you do it right, you can make a condo into a, a decent, uh, investment opportunity. Financing approval. This is another thing that you kind of need to look out for. Um, there are some associations that are already FHA approved. There is a process that they have to go through both them and VA. Uh, you can look up both of those. Each of them have a website that goes over where you can just look up the community name and it will uh, show you. I'll send this document out, but it, it, there's two websites, one's the HUD and one specific to the VA, but it will show you if that uh, um, association is approved or not. Uh, I have heard some lenders being able to do spot approval where they just take the unit on it, the unit itself, and then get it approved. I have not done that before though. Um, uh, okay. Uh, just general, Tips, like I said, questionnaires, lender questionnaire needs to be ordered on the buying side. This will be ordered by the lenders. You don't need to really worry about that. It's built into the loan process. Uh, they look into the finances, structural health of the association, as well as the unit. Uh, lenders are getting very serious about these. Uh, there was an incident in Florida, I think it's almost three years ago now, where uh, half of the building collapsed and uh, like half the association died. It was really terrible. And it was almost 100% preventable because the HOA board just kept on uh, deferring maintenance. And because of that, insurance companies were like, look, you knew that all these things needed to be repaired, yet you didn't, and then the building collapsed. This is uninsurable. This is all your fault. And they didn't end up paying out like a lot of stuff, a, a lot of money for that. So um, make sure the lender has ordered these documents. Like I said, they're usually pretty on it. Um, the ones that I have seen issues with though are the like online mortgage companies. Um, occasionally the underwriters will have specific questions for the HOA management, but they will usually reach out to the management companies themselves directly. Uh, HOA demand statements, these are ordered by escrow. I highly recommend just checking with escrow to make sure that these have been ordered. Typically they will do their job, but if you know how escrow operates, there's usually the closer, uh, closing officer who is 
very good at their job, but then they have a bunch of assistants working for them who are then ordering all these documents. And they are, in my experience, very stressed and overworked individuals and can oftentimes miss things like this. And I have seen closings be delayed because of this. Um, so I would be pretty diligent about that. Um, basically, it just includes the dues, any fees or fines, like a move and move out, and what is owed at the time of closing. So it's good information, definitely necessary. I would definitely check with Pesco if it was me on my deal. Um, A good thing to know is rules and regulations aren't legal documents. They're derived from the bylaws and they are put forth by the HOA board and the HOA board was given their power by the bylaws and those are recorded along with the declaration. Um, they're not a legal document. The board has the authority laid out in the declaration to create and enforce them. Uh, some of them can be very detailed. Some of them can be pretty nonspecific. Uh, and enforcement always can depend on the board. Some boards can be very strict about things. Some boards can just not really care. We had an association that had a no pet policy, but people had pets in there. And finally, they looked at their rules and were like, we didn't even realize that there was no pets allowed in here. So they had to vote to change it. Although, Amending the declaration costs a lot of time and money because you have to get an attorney to draft up an amendment and, it, and then get all the owners to vote on it. And um, a change in uh, declaration, I believe you need over two thirds vote and getting people to vote and participate in HOA boards is sometimes kind of tricky. Um, it's just kind of breakdown of different fees that you'll expect to see, move in, move out fee, kind of went over that, transfer fees, that's pretty normal, HOA transfer fee, and then the management company transfer fee, pet fees, seeing those typically yearly. Um, some associations have pet restrictions, limits, like dog breeds and weights, no more than like 50 pounds usually, and then like no more than two of two dogs or two cats or one of each. Uh, but then I've also seen some really silly things like ones that have specifically uh, outlawed monkeys and armadillos, which, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I want to be able to keep my armadillo in my association, but I guess something happened so that we can't do that anymore. Uh, Master HOA. This is more with planned unit developments that I've seen where there'll be communities inside kind of a master HOA planned uh, unit development. It, this, the one that we had was over in um, Bellevue, Snoqualmie area, where we only managed a small community, but in that the entire kind of subdivision was under the a master HOA. Typically these are like yearly and fairly small, $25 to $100. Um, rental fees, sometimes the associations will charge for renting out of the unit. Uh, quick overview of the board, typically three to five members. Ideally, there's a president, vice president, treasurer, secretary, and a member at large. I've seen, although, like I said, sometimes it's very hard to get all of those positions filled. Sometimes there's very active boards. Sometimes there's not very active boards. Uh, terms can vary one to three years. Some require election cycles, so they're not all elected at the same time. Uh, and these are not paid positions. So it's like I've had friends who have been on the board and they said it was like one of the most stressful things that they've ever done. So there's some people that like doing this and are very active and want to make sure that their community is maintained. And then there's some people that kind of use it as um, an outlet for their own personal agendas. So you kind of have to be wary. That is not anything you can really control. Although having a more active board is always better than having a less active board. Um, 
budget is created yearly with the help of the management company. It is then voted and ratified on by the association. Typically, it's this is done in November, um, but it also depends on the association's fiscal year. This is where the dues are set for the year. If there's a special assessment that's needed, they will vote on that and what the amount of frequency will be. Every year, an association is supposed to have an annual general meeting. Typically, this happens in the first quarter. This is usually when they will discuss special projects and elect new board members. Special meetings can be held anytime during the year. Typically, those are vote, uh, discuss or vote on things that cannot wait till the AGM. That's like if there is a special assessment or a project that needs to happen like immediately. Um, most of the time those will be open to the entire uh, community, but sometimes it can be just the board. Uh, special assessments, pretty straightforward. However, if the board is doing their job correctly, you shouldn't have to have a special assessment. They should just raise their regular assessment dues to meet the reserve funding requirements. People kind of don't understand that. Um, People were just like, oh, high dues, this is a terrible place to live. It's like, no, the board's actually more active in being diligent about what they are supposed to be doing. So, um, and typically they'll raise those dues for a certain amount of time so they can meet those reserve requirements and then they'll lower them back down. We had an association that was replacing their windows and it was going to be like a massive project. Um, and so their dues were like $1,500 a month. It was pretty insane, but that was only said to last about five years. And then it was going to go back down to about 500. So, um, insurance, I would always reach out to the broker and just double check what insurance is required for the homeowner. This is on the buy side. Uh, I just like to make sure my buyer knows what insurance they should be getting. It's just a value add, I think, to be able to let them know what they what coverage they should be getting. Um, typically, most insurance companies will be able to bundle that in with whatever their current insurance policy is. Like I said, walls in, uh, I think it's HO6 is the specific policy that they'll need. Earthquake insurance is always a good thing because we're in the earthquake area, um, but it's typically very expensive. So uh, a lot of associations don't have it because of that. Rentals, that. Co-ops are a weird subset where they're like condos. However, the owners are shareholders and they own a percentage share of the building uh, rather than a specific unit. So they'll own 5% of the building. They don't even own their unit. It's weird um, and they're pretty specific. They don't actually need resale certificates, so you won't order one if it's a co-op. Uh, property taxes are typically included in the dues as well too, and the insurance for these is different as well too. Um, 55 plus communities are typically, they have you know at least one member of the, or one person of the household who is on the deed has to be 55 plus. However, I just ran into something last week where every member of the household has to be over 55 plus. So again, kind of so depends on the association community, how stringent or strict they wanna be about these rules. Um, but in order to actually make an offer, they have to submit uh, identification saying that they're over 55 plus. Um, so general pros and cons, I think condos are an excellent affordable entry to the housing market, good for first time, find first time home buyers and also older folks who are looking to downsize and are, uh, don't want to do all the kind of landscape and upkeep that comes with, uh, owning a home. Uh, it's like most of the time the landscaping the maintenance all the insurance is all taken care of so it's a lot less to worry about uh seattle i think was one of the first metropolitan cities to start developing them for that reason i believe we have a higher rate of condos in the city so it's good to just if you want to stay in the city don't can't afford two million dollars for house in queen anne but you still want to be close to climate pledge arena, then you can get a condo and it's um, a lot more easier to afford and you can obtain, a, you can still have that lifestyle living in the city. Most of them will have 
some sort of amenity. Gyms and clubhouses are typically the most prevalent. Uh, however, if you get out into communities, they'll typically have pools and playgrounds. Um, cons, boards can be very fun to deal with. Some boards are very lenient, some are very strict. Depends on who's on the board and who's on the board changes every one to three years. Uh, that's all I'll say about that. Uh, most are not FHA approved because uh, there's, because most associations don't want FHA people, which I think is, I see their reasoning, the less down payment, the more, the less invested you are. However, it's like, this is how they're trying to get into the market. And um, these are the two websites that you can go to check if they're FHA or VA approved. Uh, and like I said, if one unit is delinquent, it can make it very hard for somebody to purchase or refinance. Um, and typically, if you want to do any sort of major renovation, even though um, you do have control of inside your unit, you still have to get approval from the board. And a lot of times they'll have restrictions on what materials can or cannot be used or what colors you can paint the exterior. Or like if you can have bird baths or garden gnomes in your lawn. So. Um, cool. Any, any questions? I know that was a lot of information. I apologize uh, for just being a fire hose, but and I hope that was clear and succinct. I've done this for so long that I kind of like, yeah, this is all just normal. 